Opening program parameters. Player code established. Welcome, Welcome. to the program. A production of the Metal Robot.com. Nobody cares about the robot gimmick. Just start the fucking show already. Ugh. Humans are determined assholes. This is the Metal Robot Podcast. Initializing playback. Welcome to MRP, the Metal Robot Podcast, a podcast about all things metal and everything in between. It's another week, another podcast, and a lingering head cold sticking its ugly head into the podcast recording. Don't worry, it's not COVID, and thank Lemmy, it's not monkeypox either. I double-checked. But we're going to power through it now that I'm functional once again, and boy, it's a good thing I am. We've got a continuation of our interview with Sunfire TV, getting into the fun bits of her live streams, including the colorful cast of characters she brings on. As well, we have Scott Wilson of Demircus to tell us the shitty story of why they had to go on hiatus. News of the week to follow, including the weird controversy going on with Matt Cameron of Pearl Jam and a Taylor Hawkins tribute article on Rolling Stone. But coming up in a few short moments, we'll check out that new Anvil record and other new releases from the week. All this and more, so let's not waste much more time and let's get into the show. I'm Tom McKay and this is the Metal Robot Podcast. You're listening to MRP, the Metal Robot Podcast. Welcome to the show. Here we go. We've got a good selection of metal albums to talk about here on the podcast. So let's not waste more time than needed and let's talk about some metal. If you have any albums you want me to talk about on future episodes of the podcast, as always, send me an email, tmckay at themetalrobot.com. That's T-M-C-K-A-Y at themetalrobot.com. Or reach out on my socials, Facebook and Twitter at The Metal Robot, Instagram at the dot metal robot. Be sure to use the hashtag Metal Robot Podcast when doing so. Now, without further ado, let's take a look at what we've got. Anvil's impact is imminent. Can I just start off by saying, that album art of an anvil-shaped meteorite on course away from Earth for some reason is just, mwah, chef's kiss, perfect, no notes. Now, Anvil's latest album, I think, is kind of an interesting look at one of the biggest strengths and weaknesses of Anvil's sound. First, let's look at what's enjoyable about this album. Production-wise, this is clear and gut-punching, allowing the performance above all else to shine through, rather than worrying about, oh, is this timed properly? Are we on the grid? And whatever bullshit modern producers sometimes worry about. You don't get that here. This isn't time-aligned in the slightest. It's not sloppy, but you can tell this is a band of humans playing some heavy metal. And of course, the performances are there. Steve Lips, Kudlow's guitar riffs are just as catchy and infectious as ever. Chris Robertson's bass is just as tasteful, especially those cool little bass licks on T-Bag is the kind of sound you want from your bass. And the drums from Rob Reiner are locking in that groove to keep you bobbing your head, if not banging it relentlessly. Anvil fans are definitely going to get a kick out of this one for sure, but therein lies the core issue with Anvil's music. Its reach outward isn't exactly its strongest. I mean, don't get me wrong, this isn't a bad album, and Anvil are great, great metal players, but unless you're already a fan of Anvil, the chances of you spinning Impact is Imminent and then shitting Anvils thereafter are very low at the best of times. The songs are slightly mid-tempo plots, with lyrics that are entertaining at best and glue-sniffingly stupid at worst. They've been compared to Spinal Tap before, and given how ridiculous these guys can get sometimes, it's not hard to see why. And of course, one of the bigger downers of Anvil's music, Kudlow's vocals. He's not bad, in fact, I think he's perfect for Anvil's music overall, but I wouldn't be the first one to say he's not exactly the strongest vocalist on the planet, and for many people he could be an acquired taste. It's in many ways uh, something that can create a gap for people who might want some Canadian heavy thrash metal, but then they just hear Kudlow and no. Like, it's not terrible, but it's not the best either. I don't know. I'm not you. If this sounds like something you'd be interested in, Impact is Imminent is a fun record with some dumb stuff that's also fun. Like, take, for example, Lockdown, which is about exactly what you think it's about. <laughs> Only a band as weird and goofy as Anvil can rhyme quarantine and COVID-19 in a song and somehow still get away with it. I cannot stress enough how impressive and stupid that actually is. It's impressively stupid. 
these guys are fun. Overall, 12 out of 15. It's not for everyone, but if you want a fun heavy metal record with a thrash tinge, Anvils definitely got you covered. Minerva's Hollow. If Anvils release is too polished for you, then Jesus Christ on the top hat, Minerva's about to make Anvil sound like fucking Katy Perry. Front to back on Hollow, the trio of Brian Hawk, Kevin Jennings, and Gina Irsolini set the tone with guitars more fuzzed out than a drunk cop performing his own DUI, droning bass and slow but ruthless drums, and it never lets up for even a second. The thing I love about sludgy stoner metal is the fact that they try to feel larger than life sometimes, and I think Minerva definitely lives up to that. Songs like the title track almost feel gargantuan in the scale of the sound, and that's only with just the basic core metal instruments. And much like Anvil, once again the performance is preserved. There's no polish on this thing, actually zero, it's all grit and all human. Almost to the point where it feels sloppy in places, but when a sloppy rhythm is repeated almost identically to before, you realize, oh, the slop is intentional. Repetition legitimizes. Yes, thank you, Adam. Basically, this is a sloppy bitch. And for those who are into sloppy bitches, this is a sloppy one for sure. But again, it's all obviously intentional. The only thing I will say about this, it, this is completely a nitpick, but while it's great for its niche of sludgy stoner metal, if you're the kind of guy or gal who wants bling studded metal with lots of tuning and polish or someone who likes it faster than a jackrabbit on speed, then uh, I'm afraid Dr. Robot would recommend against this particular prescription. It's not required that you don't listen, but Minerva is slower than a turtle on the most potent strain of pot known to existence. Okay, not that slow, but they're not fast either. Also, the sloppy nature of this is hard to get into if you're used to that kind of overproduced metal music, where everything is as close to the grid as possible, if not sitting directly on it. Oh god, the fuzz will fuck you up! But even after all of that, if you want a chill evening with some heavy fuzzed out metal, then a solid 13.5 out of 15 is more than enough to tide you over the brownies that you just ate. Wait, you didn't eat the whole fucking thing, did you? Oh, good luck, my dude. You are in for an uncomfortable eight hours. All right, we got a couple of Scarlet Records releases here on the podcast. First one up is some Finnish melodic death metal in the form of Thy Kingdom Will Burn with the new album The Void and The Vengeance. Now, there's a reason I specifically called out Scarlet Records here, because they are the same label who signed Nocturna for Daughters of the Night. And podcast listeners remember how much I loved that one. And it's not just Nocturna, though. The label seems to be very picky with who they sign on, given how few artists they've actually signed. It's not because they're new either, they've been around since 98, and many of the bands I've heard from them have only continued to show high quality metal. And of course, that high quality metal trend continues with this album. Holy shit! I wasn't sure exactly what I was to expect from this album, but my god, I was satisfied. The album starts off strong with some blackened influence on Between Two Worlds and continues to impress as it goes on. Veil of Wicked Sky definitely shows more of that MDM sound that you'd expect, but throughout, I couldn't help but grinning like an idiot through the whole thing. No joke, seriously, I don't know if you've seen me genuinely smile in any photos, because every single photo I take, I just look like I'd let out a huge fart and I'm waiting to see the aftermath, but when I genuinely smile in photos, I look like a depressed Joker holding his mouth open into a smile with clothespins so that Batman doesn't think something's wrong. It sounds and looks sad, but that's what I look like smiling. And that's exactly what I looked like when I was listening to this Thy Kingdom Will Burn album. Seriously, there really isn't much I didn't enjoy about this release. It's not too long, it's very engaging and entertaining. This is just some skilled performances from some fantastic players and a great musical experience. If I had to nitpick, maybe the genre label is a tad misleading. It's melodic death metal for sure, but the amount of blackened influence is almost too much to ignore. Now, this isn't Vintilin's Welcome My Last Chapter or anything, but anybody expecting Arch Enemy or In Flames are going to be in for a bit of a surprise. Though, even then, uh, it's not too different, I'll be honest. But then again, those are nitpicks. The Void and the Vengeance is a great blackened MDM album that you definitely need to check out. 14 out of 15, enough said, go get it. Oh, 
Bulgarian's Red Dragon, another Scarlet Records band featuring the vocals of Federica Lana of Sleeping Romance and the guitars and songwriting of Federico Mondelli of Frozen Crown. Any Frozen Crown fans listening immediately perked up their ears, maybe their nipples as well. Totally understandable, I agree. Now, given that the writing abilities of Frozen Crown are involved with this project, you can only expect the best possible symphonic power metal possible. And the thing is, while that's for sure what we get here, it's also slightly more gothic than you might expect. From Stay all the way to Descent, this album feels like a bit of a pop record that happens to be metal, which I think is expected from gothic metal, but it's especially prominent here. Not so much that metalheads hitting play will go up in flames, but enough that it's for sure noticeable in the songwriting. But that's as far as that goes, as Federico Mondelli's guitars, Massimiliano Rossi's bass, and Alberto Mezzanotte's drums remind you that this is a metal record, even if there is a bit more polish than most would like. And actually, that's one of the things I think Volturian's Red Dragon has that will make a few metalheads avoid it like it's a much-needed shower. While it's not overproduced, the grit and roughness is non-existent. I know that this is something that is to be expected from the goth metal genre from time to time, but after the last few albums we talked about today, can you really blame me for bringing that up? But then again, if you're complaining about polish and metal, I wouldn't be surprised if polish will make you throw up like after eating a bar soap like it's a dollar burger at a local Denny's dumpster takeout. But there is something I know I noticed. This is very much a nitpick for me, it means probably nothing for anybody, but this isn't terribly different from anything you would have heard from Federico's work. Mondelli is a fantastic metal songwriter, able to write catchy, infectious, and epic songs, but he is what I call a one-style songwriter. If you've heard one Federico song, you've probably heard all of them. No, seriously, you think I mentioned Nocturna out of recent jaw-dropping habits? Federico wrote their songs too, and the second Stay's main riff in the intro came in, I immediately did a double take to make sure I didn't hit the shuffle button by accident. But like I said, that's a minor nitpick. Volturian sound on Red Dragon isn't a carbon copy of other Federico works, and especially with Federica Lana's vocals, it does separate itself more from other bands in the style. I personally would have liked a bit more uniqueness to help it stick out more, but it doesn't hurt for a songwriter to know what works for them. It's still some great gothic metal, and with a 12.5 out of 15, it's absolutely keeping up that Scarlet Records trend of great quality metal music. And that's it for reviews. I know I went on a bit of a Scarlet Records binge on that last bit, but I can't recommend enough some of the bands that these guys have signed. Like, I don't know what exactly the vetting process is with Scarlet, but I can only imagine it involves fire pits, intense Assassin's Creed style parkour runs, and maybe a blood sacrifice to the metal god. No, I don't know, something like that. Like I said earlier though, send your emails to tmckay at themetalrobot.com, reach out on my socials for any albums you would like covered on the podcast or on on the main YouTube show. Coming up, who is Demiricus, how did they come to be, and why were they forced into a hiatus 15 years ago? That's next right here on the Metal Robot Podcast. 15 plus artists, multiple cultures, multiple languages, one almost unpronounceable name. How my yoy sios, hoi Hoi me hoi hoi moi mother me what the fuck does it say? It's pronounced homi yushes. How? There's 20 O's! It's Latin. What'd you expect? The ultimate collaboration project of 2022. Homi Yushes, a symphonic, death, blackened, thrashing, grooving core fest. What genres? I wanna say I understand, and yet. I'm hurt. If I wasn't rocking out so much, I'd be scared shitless. You broke my cheese on meter 2.0. I wouldn't sleep on this one if you don't identify yourself as Petrucci Butt Pirates. Part MDM, part progressive, part blackened, all fuck. This is not a thrash metal album. Thrash heads expecting a beer infused fuck fest will have a heart attack. New installment of the fan favorite series, 10 Second Purge. Only on Metal Robot Reviews. You're listening to. MRP, the Metal Robot Podcast. All right, welcome back. Let's dive further into the world of metal and bullshit and fucking 
beer stuff. I'm improvising, don't at me. Uh, my first guest tonight has seen some shit as a part of a band and knows that bad decisions can lead to bad things. In this case, some bad decisions led to death thrash metal band Demiricus to drop themselves from Metal Blade Records, a big record label, almost fuck their tour with Dying Fetus, and thought they were never going to do this again. But 15 years later, the band reformed and dropped their third album, Chaotic Lethal. Guitar Scott Wilson sat down with me not too long ago over Zoom to talk more about this and much more. So here we go. Here is Demiricus Scott Wilson, part one. So Scott, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. How are you doing? Oh, uh, super good, man. Super good. Thanks for having us. Or me. Yeah. <laughs> us. Uh, so is there like a like someone behind the camera that we don't know about? Is it like uh, someone just creeping up? <laughs> Right no, no, I was like, it, Hi, no, I'm here too. Yeah, no, it's just fucking me by myself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no worries. Hey, you know what? It's okay because we still got you here and that's all that matters. So welcome so much to the Metal Robot Podcast. I appreciate your time here. So uh, before we get started here, just tell me a bit more about uh, about uh, you, the band, uh, you know, what, what, how this whole thing began for you. Uh, how the whole band began, like, sure. period? like back in 2002 or whatever it was. Uh, man, I, uh, it, I, it started with like, uh, I think me and Nate really, uh, we were like super good friends already roommates. Uh, we are like, we, we, uh, I can't say we grew up skating together, but we, we started skateboarding together, like, uh, you know, late nineties, like 99 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, which we still do. Like we still, I mean, I, I've been skateboarding for like 30 years. That's like my shit. You know what I mean? Uh, right. Yeah. So like we, we, uh, we did that. Uh, you know, we were like, that, that was all we did. It's just like fucking eight hours of skateboarding, like every day of our lives. Jesus. Uh, dude, I, I like, I, I moved to Cincinnati at one point and I, I had a job where I, I only worked like four hours a day. The rest of it was just skating. You know, I, that, that was it. Dude. That was our lives, dude. Wow. Um, and so when I moved back, I moved back in 99 and that's when like Nate and I, like we were friends, but like, that's when like Nate and I were like tight as fuck. And so we would just, we would try to get hyped up, you know what I mean? And like, so we would like, you know, cause we knew that like whatever spot we were going to was going to be fucking gnarly. We were probably going to get our asses kicked and we we're going to throw ourselves off of flights of stairs and whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, like, we stuff. Would, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we would just like, we would just blast uh, like Sepulter or Slayer or whatever, you know what I mean? Whatever the whatever we were in the mood for um and just fucking get psyched you know to just eat shit <laughs> fuck yeah <laughs> and, uh, I'm, and, uh, listening, I'm still listening to i'm still on the the whole eight eight hours thing like how the fuck are you able to like keep up the stamina for eight hours i hear eight hours and i'm like <sighs> i can I mean, barely yeah, do I'm, one <laughs> i mean well we were in our 20s this is fucking this is 22 years ago i'm talking about uh, age doesn't I mean? matter bro i'm in my 20s i don't think that matters <laughs> yeah Eight hours might be a little bit of an exaggeration. You know, okay. I'm, I'm sure there was days where there was eight <laughs> hours, you know what I mean? But like as many hours as our bodies would allow. Sure. Um, okay. To do it, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so we, just, we did that for years and like, uh, and then there was a point there where like, I, I don't know. I was like, fuck, what are we doing? Maybe I'll go to school or some shit. And he, he was doing the same thing. And we ended up going to uh, Heron school of art. Uh, in town in Indianapolis and uh, kind of at the same time. So we were all, we were still mm -hmm. hanging out or whatever. And uh, we met uh, our drummer on the first album. Uh, we met Chris Cruz there. Um, and he was already in a band and like, whatever. Uh, so we went to go see him one night. Uh, I think he was in a band. I think it was called Castlevania. <laughs> and uh, sure. he's, yeah, uh, he's yeah. Big video game guy, but um, mm -hmm. he, uh, uh, he, yeah, so we went to go see them. And then that night, we pretty much decided to like start playing music together, which was like, at that point, really intimidating for me because I, I fucking barely knew what I was doing. You know, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I'll say that. I had no fucking idea what the, you know what I mean? Like, uh, so we would get together and it was just like, what the hell are, you know, but we wrote some songs and I, you know, I, I was kind of learning as we were going and, uh, and it kind of, you know, suddenly we had some songs. And, uh, but it was thin, you know what I mean? Like, uh, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. We were like, all right, let's, let's, we need another guitar player. We need something, you know? Um, and I had gone to school and skateboarded with Ben Parrish, 
uh, like we weren't like super good friends, but we like, we knew each other. Like we ran in like certain circles or whatever. And, uh, he was in a band called upheaval and they had just broken up. Um, and, uh, so he was just kind of twiddling his thumbs and, uh, and it was just the minute he stepped in to that spot was like, Oh shit. Okay. Like I, uh, this went from like a couple geeks sticking around to suddenly I think we have a band here, you know? Uh, so that, that's when I, when we invited Ben in, that's when it got real serious. And, uh, I mean, I, we were still, I was still a child. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, but we started playing shows and like, you know, coming out with demos. We had like two demos. There was a 2003 and a 2004, uh, before the actual full lengths came out. Mm-hmm. Um, just playing around town and, uh, that's how, that's how it started. You know, basically skateboarding, skateboarding and a little bit of art school. I was, I only went to art school for like fucking 20 minutes. I've, I don't know, I quit, but, but yeah, fuck you know. art school, right? <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's how I felt. Yeah. I, I, you know, I felt like I needed purpose, but it turns out uh, my only, the only reason I went there was to meet Chris Cruz and start this band. So sure. And, uh, what's Chris up to as he's still in the band? I don't remember if I saw that in the lineup. He's not, uh, he's not, we, we got signed to metal blade and we started and he, he is on the first album. He, he played drums on the first album. Mm. Um, but the second we started talking about touring and shit like that, uh, he was kind of like, I'm out. Uh, I'm wasn't done. into it. Uh, yeah, I, no. And I, I can't blame him, man. I, you know, he, he, he had some pretty good reasons that made sense. And, uh, we were just like, all right, you know, all right, we'll, we'll figure something out. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. which was kind of rough because we, we went through, we went through some drummers trying out different things and toured with a few people and what, and it, uh, and it didn't, we've kind of had a rough time there until, till Dustin, uh, said yes. So, Hey, you know what, from what I heard from the, that new album, I think that was a pretty good choice though. I do got to say that much. Oh yeah. 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 Dustin is fucking flawless. Like that, yeah. that was another, that was another one of those, like, uh, like, you know, huge moments where it was just like, fuck. All right. We found, this is the dude. You know what I mean? Uh, um, oh, yeah. and he, he, he recorded, he was on two, uh, he was on poverty. So he was on the second album. Uh, Dustin was, and, uh, yeah, dude, the second he stepped in, it fit like a glove, best friends. Holy shit. Here we go. You know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly how it's gotta be though. Right. Like with yeah, new members, does. you gotta have it like that. Otherwise it's just like, what the fuck are you doing? Right. It does. It does. And I, I know that I, I didn't realize that until we lost Chris and we tried to fill his shoes, uh, with, you know, beautiful people, but there's, there, there's something, I don't know. There wasn't chemistry. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, well, how and, long uh, did it take for you to find, uh, for, to find Dustin? Uh, I, man, I don't know. Cause we're, I, we're talking a lot of years ago. We're talking. Well, okay. Better question. Uh, how like many drummers did you go through before you found Dustin? Um, th- three or four so uh, three or four. We, I, we had several different people play a few different shows. We, uh, we played CBGBs with one guy. We played uh, Chicago with another one of our friends. We, uh, uh, God, <laughs> uh, I don't know, man. We just, uh, we just had fill-ins for a little while. It was weird. It was pretty weird. It was pretty weird. And there's a lot of stories there. I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but some of them no, didn't no, no. work. And, uh, uh w- w- is Chris still, uh, are you guys still in contact with Chris? Uh, what's he up to? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, he still rules, man. He's, uh, as a matter of fact, he's, uh, he, he's got two kids. He lives right down the street. I just went to his, uh, 40th birthday party. Like, oh, no kidding. Huh? Um, he actually is like, he makes video games now, uh, which is really, fucked. yeah, 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 dude. He's like, that's fucking just, awesome. Would it be, would have uh, been anything I've played in recent days or no, 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 no. Cause, uh, I think he's, he's fairly new to it, but like they, they made their own and they started making like, I, he's, he's going to be pissed at me if he watches this interview. Cause I don't know the terms or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but like a whole arcade fucking game, they made uh, tons of them Oh, okay, uh, okay. and it was ones that they made from fucking scratch. And he like, he's, He's kind of like a renaissance man. He's like really good at everything. So he's really good at like art. He's really good at guitar. He's really good at drums. He's really good at fucking whatever the fuck he sets his mind to, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, But dude, he created all the graphics and all the, I'll send you a link to the website. It was called, uh, uh, I haven't seen much of it lately because I think he got a job from that, like from making that kind of got him a job, but uh, it was called sky cursor. 
and it's mm. fucking dope, dude. It's like a throwback to like kind of like eighties, like uh, you're in like a fighter pilot and you're kind of you know floating around. You're shooting all these fucking eyeballs oh, with tentacles, all this shit. Those and are the all, shit. Yeah, oh dude. fuck and, yeah, definitely send me the link. I gotta check that out. Yeah. Um, it's all his art too. It's all he all drew of his it, everything, everything. That's impressive. I really yeah. again send me the link. That sounds like a lot of fun to play. Yeah, when you see it, you'll be like, "What the fuck is this?" Yeah, but you know what? Yeah. Like, like it's good that you're still in contact with him too. And it's good that he found a different venture that he really enjoyed. And it's good that you also found Dustin because again, listening to the album, uh, it, it was a, a chaotic lethal three chaotic lethal. It's really like it's got that kind of sound to it in the drums that. I don't know if you can replicate anywhere else. It's got that pulsing thunder and that speed. Holy shit. That yeah, speed. Yeah. Dustin's kind of a maniac, man. I dude, you should, I like, if you ever see us live, like if you know the album and then you see us live, he gets fucking, I don't know if it's just like filled with adrenaline or whatever, but he plays at like 50 million miles an hour. And we're all just like, <laughs> Fucking A, dude. What the hell? <laughs> Jesus. And he's like yeah. a fucking Tasmanian okay. devil. That sounds like a challenge that I might. Yeah, I will yeah. definitely try to see if I can get that live. But um, but okay, so that, that's pretty good. Now, uh, when it comes to... So I want to clarify something here because I could not, for the life of me, find this uh, when I was looking through. Um, what instrument do you play? Do you play the guitar? I play guitar. Yeah. Okay. So uh, how much, like... Like when you joined up, you said you didn't really know what you were doing. How much guitar practice did you have when the band started? Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, my dad had an acoustic lying around when I was a kid that I fucked around with, but not really. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. kid shit. Um, and then uh, uh, I uh, like before not, from 97 to 99, I lived in uh, Cincinnati. I moved to Cincinnati like just for skateboarding. I didn't drink or anything or whatever. And I didn't know a whole hell of a lot of people. So we would skate for as many hours as possible. Like I was saying, and then I would go home and I didn't have anything to do. So I just bought, this is, we're talking, I'm like 1920 at this point. Mm, okay. Uh, so I just bought like a piece of shit, like, uh combo thing, right? You know what I mean? Like it was like a PV <laughs> shitty guitar that was never in tune and a pile of shit practice amp that was like discounted if you bought both or whatever. And then I just bought like Slayer and Metallica and Megadeth uh, tablature books. And I just, I sat there every night and just kind of dicked around. But I didn't really know it was going to come to anything. You know what I mean? I didn't even know what the fuck, I didn't, I didn't know what I was looking at. I barely knew what tablature was. I didn't, I didn't know what palm uh, muting was or anything. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yeah, what, yeah I didn't no, know. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So when we started, when we started the band, it was like, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to have to learn real fast, especially when, you know, like, especially when Ben, started because he was like i mean he's he's fucking good his fingers mm -hmm. are like fucking water dude there's you know so uh so i had i you know i had to kind of pick it up as fast as possible not fuck around so well hey you know it, it ended up turning out pretty good i'd say uh and you know yeah. what like if, if anything like most people nowadays in metal from what i understand at least most people don't know what they're doing on guitar either so <laughs> Honestly, this yeah. doesn't sound too foreign to me. It sounds pretty, <laughs> yeah. it sounds pretty familiar to me. <laughs> I know. I, yeah, I, I know that about a lot of us too, I, which is, which is weird because we're, uh, it's so fast and furious and a lot of these bands are throwing so many notes. You know what I mean? It's kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. that we don't know much. About going full blown, doing. like Slayer or Dragon Force, just like play as many notes as possible in like one millisecond and see how that goes. Does Dragon Force not know how the, they 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 know guitar theory? Well, though. okay, like they they can play like really good, but anybody who sees them live knows that they can't they can barely play a lot of those like faster songs uh, with the amount of accuracy that you would hear on studio albums, and, and they get a lot of shit yeah. for that too, which is its own thing. But that's either way, like it doesn't really matter, like whether you know as long as you can like at least play it audibly, you're fine. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wonder that I haven't seen a lot. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of those, like, uh, super, I don't know, you know, a million notes a minute, uh, mm. or like some of that, like new tech death type of stuff that comes out oh. that sounds real pro toolies or whatever. Mm. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of those. So I haven't I really don't seen blame a you. lot of them live, but I don't, it does. When I hear it though, like it does make me wonder, like, are these fuckers pulling this shit off live? I, Maybe they you really do got to ask that question sometimes, uh, especially I know there was one band that I uh, that I heard a while ago where I was like, 
uh, Darko US, I think they're called. And I was like, this is not even like you. You guys aren't playing any of this, are you? This is not like <laughs> computer generated gent, whatever fucking bullshit you guys are doing here. Yeah. Uh, I'm still yet to be proven wrong on that one, but I don't know I'm, either. But like I said, it's, it's it's because I'm just not a fan. I like I need right. more dirt. I was just talking about this with my well, buddy. That it's just uh, I just need more dirt. There's got to be more grit. There's got to be more human. Uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah. It, uh, when it sounds like fucking video games, I'm gone. I'm out, mm-hmm. dude. I, I can't do it. But. Uh, I, yeah. maybe they're killing it i have no idea yeah i don't blame you and this is coming from somebody who is a fan of that kind of style uh who loves like the kind of like uh proggy gent kind of stuff like i i know exactly what you're talking about the human element seems to be kind of missing in a lot of modern music which is why it's always refreshing to hear it in a lot of the more like gritty raw kind of stuff yeah yeah i, I mean that's definitely i don't want to speak for all four of us but i i think i can <laughs> When I say that that's, I mean, well, I don't know, man. We like, I, I, I want to hear the band. I want to hear the human beings play their fucking instruments. Right. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to hear the program or the, you know, the space bar on the fucking laptop. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. Um, no. So when it comes to, when it comes to the music uh, for, for your band, what, what are the inspirations that you usually go? You mentioned Slayer, Pantera, Sepultura. Uh, yeah. That are those like would you say those are your insp- inspirations for the music writing uh yeah i you know like i was saying like a, lo- a lot of uh, how i learned to play guitar was like a lot of like megadeth metallica slayer tablature you know what i mean and you can hear that mm-hmm. you know uh in my writing but i uh in the stuff that i write at least but we all collaborate so and uh nate nate likes uh i don't know we all we all have a little bit of different tastes uh Ben's just old school as fuck. I don't think he's listened to anything new in fucking 25 years. You know <laughs> what I mean? He's still just like, all right, I'm going to listen to Pierced from Within again, or I guess, or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I'm going to listen to <laughs> Vulgar Display again. I don't think, you know what I mean? I don't think he's, I don't know what he's doing, but uh, he's real old school, uh, you know, and then uh, and he only listens to his favorite shit. I don't think he really does too much research, uh, you mm. know, trying to find different bands or whatever uh nate nate tends to like it a little bit more dirty a little like motorhead ish kind of you know grit um so you know we all kind of come together and just kind of you know uh pace things together in a way that makes sense you know i'll bring some shit nate will bring some shit ben will bring some shit we'll just you know we'll put our little spin on whatever and you know uh puzzle piece these things together so that they make sense um but I mean, I, yeah, I, you know, you can hear it. I, like any press that we've ever gotten are like, everybody's just like, oh, they sound like Slayer or whatever, especially on the first album, mm-hmm. uh, which is uh, fucking fine. I don't know. Well, yeah. Okay, yeah, we do. <laughs> whatever. I don't know. I, you know, whatever. I don't know. That's how I learned how to play guitar. There it is. You know, hey. I'm not really that ashamed of it. Well, you know, well, yeah, what works is what works. Um, so with, so with the, like uh, with the, I haven't been able to pronounce it correctly at all. Uh, Demiricus, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, okay, yeah. perfect. Uh, so <laughs> with Demiricus, uh, leading up to this current album, Cha- uh, Chaotic Lethal, you guys took a 15-year-long break, uh, so much so that the promo even uh, specified uh, that it was an extended hiatus. Uh, yeah. Why did you end up taking a hiatus? Uh, was like, what happened 15 years ago? Uh, I, we, uh, Two came out. I'll say this. I, uh, I, I, I hate to place blame. I, we'll take a lot of the blame. We should have been a lot more DIY. The four of us should have been a lot more hands-on instead of just passing the buck to our manager at the time. Mm. Our manager was really good at helping us get signed. But uh, after that, I don't think he knew what to do with us. So, but he was also very, uh, uh, God, he just, he had this way of talking where we're just like, all right, I guess we'll just, okay, we'll do what you're talking about. And so we ended up playing like, we ended up playing fucking tons and tons of tours and shows that just didn't make a bit of sense. We were playing to an audience that like did not want to hear what we were doing. You know what I mean? And like, I like 
you know, back then there was a lot of these like Christian hardcore bands and whatever. I, mm-hmm. you know, I, and we ended up like playing with like a lot of them, like opening for a lot of them, whatever. Like we were all at the time just like, what the fuck are we doing? Mm-hmm. But we, uh, you know, we, but we didn't have much options. I, and then the tours that we did get on that were pretty good. Those went really well, but they were few and far between. I don't know. Anyways, there was a lot of mismanagement, I would say, and mm-hmm. a very, there's a lot of uh, financial, unfortunate financial decisions that just kind of tanked us. Like at one point we were on, we were on tour with Dying Fetus. We we're in New York and uh, dude, I, I know we had thousands of dollars in the bank account and I went to pay, I went to get gas and my card was declined. And I was like, what the fuck is happening? Like, and it turns out that like our manager paid a bill that we owed to a company we should have never gone with for merch and like well, I don't know it, like oh. and at that point we had we had been on tour for like two years straight and like Ben was having a kid, uh, you know it was and like all of us were kind of like turning thirty and, and we were just like what the f- uh, like what are we doing you know mm-hmm. and like. At that point, I immediately, like, we, we were just like, fuck, we've had it. We fired our manager. Uh, and we went home in the middle of this fucking dying fetus tour because we had to. We didn't have any fucking money, you know? Uh, you know, and that was back in the day, too, when, like, well, it, it's, the, it's up there again. But, like, gas was, like, four fifty or whatever a gallon. Was, <laughs> uh, you know, we're driving this fucking, you know what I mean? We're driving this, like, 15-passenger van with a 16-foot trailer and all that shit all over. Uh, and we're get our guarantees are, like, $100 and, like, I don't know. We were opening for bands. We didn't, didn't make any sense. We just, we made a lot of bad decisions. Mm. We went on a lot of tours. We could have, we could have waited for better tours. Well, I mean, this was like pretty early on in the career, right? So you're going to end up making a lot of, of decisions that maybe aren't the best, but it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like you lost quite a bit of money to a company that you said you probably shouldn't have gone with because of mismanagement of finances, et cetera, et cetera. But that sounds like a really shitty situation in the middle of a, of a dying fetus tour, no less. Yeah. You know, I like, we were talked into weird, like I said, we were talking into weird shit. We were, we were buying our merch from like a company that the same company that like Snoop Dogg and Megadeth get their shit from. And it's like, why are we doing that? We have friends at home that make fucking t-shirts and shit like that. You know what I mean? Uh, there was just, there yeah. was just weird fucking decisions. Meanwhile, we've got a, they don't care about us because they're a huge company. We've got a fucking van full of youth larges that we can't get rid of. And it's like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, man. There was just a lot of things kind of just fell apart at once. And uh, I don't know, man, we got home after ditching that tour. We felt, I mean, it sucked, man. All of us mm-hmm. were like, all of us were like, fuck this man. And uh, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's not like we're money hungry. No, of course not. We like, but we, we were coming home with nothing. Like we were all coming home and just, you know, being like, uh, you know, my girlfriend at the time or whatever, or, you know, just being like, God, I I hope that you have been working because I I didn't bring anything home, you know? Uh, And we did that for a while and it was, Mm. I don't know. And so we all remained friends. Like we all still always like loved each other, you know, but once we kind of got rid of our manager and uh, I, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure we knew what to do. And uh, I think I, I don't, I never really talked to metal blade, but I think metal blade was kind of like, all right, yes, guess this isn't going to work out. And then, uh, so we just, we just dropped it and, uh, and we remained friends, but you know, 12 years went by and uh and yeah, we didn't, I mean, there was no real talk of like ever getting back together or anything. I thought it was just going to be like something I did a long time ago, you know? But what did you guys end up doing in the meantime? Because there's 15 years without uh, a band, without touring, without new music. What did you guys end up getting up to in the meantime? <laughs> I mean, you know, marriage, divorce, uh, you know, kids, uh, uh I bartended a lot. I drank way too much for, mm. you know, a long time. Uh, ben, um, Ben didn't really fuck with music the whole fucking time. Uh, 
Nate was in a couple bands. Uh, he was in one uh, called Cult Hammer that was, uh, they didn't come out with a whole lot of material, but they were pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, a lot of regular shit. I, you know what I mean? I, um, a lot of regular people shit. I just, I, I, I was ready to just bow out, you know? Uh, well, if it, something must have happened that made you change your mind because we got an happened. album 15 years later. So what yeah, yeah. changed? Uh, well, um, you know, I, I like, I don't know, 12 years had passed. And then uh, to be honest with you, um, Dustin, I tell you what, I forgot to tell you, Dustin, he he was the drummer for Skeleton Witch for uh, a lot of those years, like mm. at least eight of them. So he was out there touring and uh, doing all kinds of shit with those dudes. And, uh, anyways, whatever, he comes back home. Um, you know, like I said, we all stayed friends over the years, but, uh, you know, we just didn't do anything. And then, uh, metal sucks came out with a, uh, came out with an article, you know, that, uh, website metal. Uh, I know metal sucks. Yeah. 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 It's just like a metal news website or whatever. They came out with an article and, uh, they mentioned us like right in the top thing you know it was kind of like if you like this band then you might like this band of course it was like slayer like if you like slayer you might like demiricus or whatever mm-hmm. and uh you know I, I think dustin was just like 12 years later somebody's writing about us or whatever you know what i'm mean? so he just i don't i think that just lit a fire under his ass and he was just like dude start texting everybody hey man you know and uh and everybody was like yeah yeah yep <laughs> just nobody's just, doing yeah. shit it's like all right yeah cool Actually, yeah, I do. Let's fucking do it. You know what I mean? And like, I had to like, I had like, I had to like rebuy guitars and shit and all, all kinds of gear and to get it going. And we played a, uh, we played a reunion show in town uh, and it went the fuck off. And uh, it was uh, like sold out, just ape shit. And it was like, all of us were just like, oh, okay. And I think like right after that, we just went right to the fucking basement and started writing three. So. Holy shit. After a yeah. metal sucks article, no less. <laughs> I, know. I know that dude rules too, man. I, uh, they ended up premiering one of our singles lately too. Cause I hit him up. I was like, dude, you know, I think his, his name is Axel. I can't remember his real name. Oh yeah. Name Axel. Uh, f- Axel I forgot Rosen- his last name already. Rosenberg. Rosenberg. Right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Fuck. Yeah. Those guys are good. Those guys. <laughs> hey, it's super. Yeah, yeah it's uh, like they were super psyched. Yeah, we'll 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 do the single. You know what I mean? We'll premiere it for you. Like like super guy on your back. All this show. Like oh, all right, man, tight, dude. So I told him the story too because you know I was just like, you guys kind of got us going. It'd be awesome if you would do this single for us. You would like. No questions asked. Yep. All right. We're going to stop right there for now. That was part one with Demir Kisses, Scott Wilson. And man, just mind blowing how so quickly things went to shit back then. And, you know, the fact is that this could have happened to anybody. And the fact that it can even happen to someone signed to a big label playing with big, well-known bands, I think speaks for itself how badass touring musicians really are, that they can do so much of the hard stuff to get here when it's so easy, so fucking easy to fall off the map and disappear entirely. Scott will be joining me next week to finish talking about the main reason I brought him on, 3 Chaotic Lethal, which is out now through post recordings. Okay, don't go anywhere. We've got news of the week coming right up on the Metal Robot Podcast. This week's Metal News Recap is brought to you by My Sanity. Everything is so depressing! Why?! To stay up to date with the latest in the metal scene, check out TheMetalRobot.com for videos, reviews, press, and so much more. Now, back into the podcast. Presented by TheMetalRobot.com, this is MRP News. There are some big stories from this week, but really nothing we haven't seen much of before, and some of it actually is not that suckish. Speaking of suckish, though, uh, I was sick last week, so I could not do the show. But since I'm here for the new segment, I want to get this one out of the way. Trevor Sternad will be missed. The fucking legend was lost too goddamn soon. We still don't have details on the cause, but when his death was made public, the band did include the National Suicide Hotline, which seriously, if you're struggling, 
talk to somebody. It's cliche to say, but it makes a huge difference. And it's really important that you do because I can't stress this enough. You fucking matter. I'll say that one more time because it's really important. I want you to listen carefully. You fucking matter. Let's get into the first story today. Starting off with a bit of a doozy, an article meant to be a tribute to the late great Taylor Hawkins has stirred up a bit of controversy. The article in question is Inside Taylor Hawkins' Final Days as a Foo Fighter, posted to Rolling Stone on Monday, and it's gone all around the rock and metal world, not because it's such a nice tribute, but because of what the article wound up being about. Taylor Hawkins apparently wanting to cut back on touring in his final days. These comments are coming from some of his friends who were a part of the article, including Pearl Jam's Matt Cameron, saying, quote, he had a heart to heart with Dave and yeah, he told me that he couldn't fucking do it anymore. Those were his words. Yeah, that's pretty blunt to say the least. Now, since that article came out, Matt has since pushed back against that on his Instagram page, saying his words were, quote, taken out of context and shaped into a narrative I had never intended. Because we haven't heard those words before. Uh, Rolling Stone has not commented on this, nor have many of the people who were featured, although Red Hot Chili Peppers drummer Chad Smith, the best Will Ferrell cosplay ever, who said in a now-deleted Instagram post, quote, The story they wrote was sensationalized and misleading, and had I known, I never would have agreed to participate. Now, I have since reached out to Rolling Stone about this to hopefully get a comment on this from the writers, as well as Matt Cameron himself to hopefully give more context to his comments, as of recording, I have not heard back. However, if I do hear something soon, I'll include it in next week's news recap. Then, in award season news, let's talk about the Junos, or as many know it as the Canadian Grammys, which I think is truly an insult. Let me tell you something here. Junos may have come five years after the Grammys, and maybe is not as big as the Grammys in terms of the audience size, but as a Canadian, I'm pretty sure that the Grammys are actually called the American Junos, but that's aside the point. Though, much like the Grammys, the rock and metal section is not always considered the biggest part of the show, especially as I watched the live stream. I did notice they gave out the award during the commercial break, so thanks guys, appreciate it. But there were a few notable acts in the nominations. Art Spire, Brand of Sacrifice, Danko Jones, Spirit Box, the agonist among the nominees, with Art Spire ultimately walking away with the award in the metal hard music album of the year thanks to their latest record bleed the future congrats to them and the rest of the nominees honestly i could not agree more with the picks then let's get into some tour news quite a few announcements from this week one of the first ones i saw actually was bring me the horizon that pop band metalheads used to like has a u.s tour coming up in late september with knocked loose grandson and sick brain they're currently touring europe at the moment their next one coming up specifically at the malta weekender from the 26th to the 30th of this month but they're not the only ones going on tour again lots of tour announcements red fang has a uk and european tour coming up in june to go along with their appearances at Hellfest, Grass Pop, and Copenhagen. Metalcore band Darkest Hour is on tour as well, celebrating the 15th anniversary of their 2007 release, Deliver Us. This was announced through Metal Sucks, and they'll be on tour with various bands at different times, like Toxic Holocaust, Zao, and Bloodlet. They'll be going through the US for the first bit until mid-July, with a European tour to follow in August. Also, Artspire, who again just won the Juno Award, congrats again guys, is going on tour in Latin America, their first Latin American tour tour to date from July through to September. If you're in Mexico, Guatemala, Brazil, San Salvador, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, and Costa Rica, see if they're coming near you. But if tech death isn't your thing, what about black metal? Garia is also doing their first Latin American tour, though they won't be coming over there till November, so you'd have to wait a bit if that's what you're into. But if you're okay with waiting, then that's something you can definitely look forward to. And again, more touring news. Ghost is touring North America after wrapping up their European tour recently. They're going with Mastodon and Spirit Box, with Mastodon being replaced by Carcass in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Now that's a hell of a lineup. And also, they're coming to Toronto on my birthday of all days. So, you know, if any of my friends are listening, I don't know, just pointing that out. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. The Grunge fans, Alice in Chains is going on tour this summer. The tour featuring Breaking Benjamin and Bush was already known and announced not too long ago, but they've now added two new dates in Michigan and New Jersey. So if you want to relive your stoner-fueled childhood, they might just be the thing you need coming up soon. 
Okay, two more and then we're done for this leg. Dream Theater's Jordan Rudess has a solo US tour in July, which, according to Metal Injection, is set to include, quote, a premiere of a new medley of Dream Theater songs created in collaboration with longtime mentee and friend Aaron Besbug. I hope to God I'm pronouncing that correctly. And finally, for the new show announcements, not a tour, but Death Clock is back in the news as the live version of the fictional band is playing at the Adult Swim Festival block party on August 5th to the 7th on the Fillmore campus campus in Philadelphia. So yeah, there's that goodness. Now while we're talking tours, I should also say to those metal bands, um, be careful, because as Creeping Death found out recently, things can go wrong. Things can get stolen. Earlier this week, the band's drummer Lincoln Mullins took to Twitter with the greatest stolen shit story I've ever read, and it has a semi-happy ending. So, starting off, the band played their first show of their tour with Carcass and Immolation this past Sunday in Albuquerque, but their trailer, which was parked in the hotel parking lot they were staying at, was stolen. Good news, the trailer has air tags and the band knows exactly where the trailer is. Hooray! Bad news, the cops won't recover it. Quote, showed Albuquerque police the exact location of three air tags and they said it's not enough to go inside the building and see because the business was closed. Going on to say in this thread, quote, they won't even come to the hotel to see the surveillance footage of our shit being taken. Happy day two of tour! Then four hours later, they did finally take a look at the footage showing that the trailer was stolen literally five minutes before the band went out and saw it. Holy shit, talk about bad timing. But then it's not over. One of the metal gods looking down upon us mere mortals said, Fuck that. And 12 hours later, Lincoln had this to say, quote, Thanks to air tags and one very nice Albuquerque sheriff, surprisingly, everything was found except for my borrowed bass drum case, sorry Brad, and our U-Haul trailer. The nice sheriff bought a long sleeve off of us upon us leaving the crime scene. End quote. Hell yeah! Some expensive shit is still missing, but at least you made bank with the local sheriff. That's how it's done, boys! I do think it's weird, though, that the air tags weren't enough for the police to actually get involved, even with the concrete proof of it being stolen and knowing where it is. This should have been much easier than it turned out to be. I don't know. I'm not a crime expert. The furthest my knowledge goes is those procedural crime shows that know as much about actual police work as humanity knows about the meaning of life. And then finally in wow, I did not see that coming news, let's talk about Metallica. Now, if you've been on the internet this week, you know exactly what I'm talking about. During a show in Brazil, our boy James Hetfield did what I don't think many of us even thought was a possibility, started talking about his insecurities. I'm an old guy, can't play anymore, all this bullshit that I tell myself in my head. So, I talked to these guys. And they helped me, as simple as that. They gave me a hug and said, hey, if you're struggling on stage, we got your back. Now, you can't see the clip on this podcast, but basically the band got up from their positions and straight up hugged the man on stage. It's just so wholesome. I can't take it. Also, it's nice to see such honesty from one of the biggest metal icons on the planet, where you wouldn't think there's these kinds of thoughts being thought of. And I get it, totally. Like, while it's not clear if this is imposter syndrome, this is still as open about their dark side as I think we've seen in a long time. Now, the band has started scaling back on their touring, according to Blabbermouth, as, according to James, that's what his body had been telling him he could do. Now, I'm sure there's going to be some people who will make fun of James for this, but hopefully that's just a minority. I'm personally of the mindset of, yeah, that shit sucks, but you're still one of the most successful bands on the planet and you deserve to be there. Who cares how old you are? But what do you think about this? Your thoughts and comments on this story or any of the others, I'd love to hear them. All right, that's going to wrap that up for this new segment. Check out TheMetalRobot.com for more news and press that can be found out throughout the week. Also, check the description of this podcast for the sources document for all stories talked about on this episode. Sunfire TV will be joining us shortly, so don't go away. This is The Metal Robot Podcast. Metal addicts call it symbiosis between extreme metal and classical music. Cult Metal Flick says cinematic landscapes collide with atmosphere. Tom McKay says, it's the reason my veins are filled with caffeine. Wait, what? I can't help it! I'd rather write awesome metal than sleep! Give me a fucking ambient, please! 
Call to the Demon Sultan is out now on all streaming platforms. And while you're at it, pick up some cool merch by going to metalrobotreviews.creatorspring.com or check the links in the podcast description. Stream now. Have you been on YouTube looking for reviews and thought, Wow! I'm so bored! Then you haven't watched Metal Robot Reviews. I missed the part where I'm no longer bored. Well, take a look. Symbols! I'm gonna offend so many people. Shit, I was supposed to review that, wasn't I? Fuck! I don't know what that was. You just played a bunch of clips. And it's all on YouTube. Wait, who was that? Don't ask, just subscribe. Search up Metal Robot Reviews on YouTube to find all the latest videos in the metal scene, including metal reviews, reactions, interviews, and the fan favorite 10 Second Purge. Subscribe now. You're listening to... MRP, the Metal Robot Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. We've got one more interview to go before we wrap things up here today. And this interview is a continuation from last week's interview with Sunfire TV. Last week, we talked about what it was like to go viral and whether or not that has changed anything for Sunfire in terms of her personality or even how she conducts herself on Twitch. And now we're getting into the even more fun stuff about the crazy characters that she's created and so much more. So here we go. This is Sunfire TV. TV part two. I want to get to this super fun one. Please, please introduce to us the new characters that we've seen in the uh, Sunfire Twitch cinematic universe thing. Who do we have in this in this uh, roster? Okay. Um, okay, so there's Toad and mm -hmm. there's Waluigi, which I haven't done ever since I did Waluigi for the first time. And people love them. You can actually see the Waluigi hat right there and then Wario hat under it. Mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of Nintendo characters, and then I did Link, which is going to happen soon again because people love Link. Link is fun. And like, yeah, it's just like one of my favorite characters and favorite games. Ocarina of Time is like, I grew up with it and I love it. And so I'm going to be doing Link again. And what people love about Link is like the noises too, because Link is like, ah, yeah, you know? So I'm mm -hmm. going to be doing that. People love that. And they're like, oh, can you please play a song as Link and do all the noises? So stuff like that is always like, they always want me to <laughs> do the Just make the noises. noise every time you hit, you hit the snare. Ha! Ha! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I should do that. <laughs> yes. Um, if you want to talk about Snapchat ca uh, characters, that there's Banana, Vampire Potato, Oh my God. Um, Pope Tato, Father Tato, <laughs> Hell Tato, the demon one. Um, oh my God. There's like a lot, but those are the main ones. I'm I mean, counting seven already. Uh, yeah. That... I mean, Ricardo the Pickle, Ramon de Lemon, Lemon, Lemon. I can't even talk. Lemon, <laughs> Lemon. He's a lemon and he's super sour and very serious. <laughs> <laughs> a um, lemon being sour. Hmm. I wonder where <laughs> I've heard that one before. <laughs> He's so serious. He doesn't talk ever. And then there's Betty, the Beverly Hills, uh, you know, chick from <laughs> Beverly Hills. You have California. a Valley Girl character? Yes, yes. Valley oh Girl. my God. That's amazing. I have not she, seen that yet. I've got to, I've got to like at some point. She will come out more. I'm sorry? She will come out more. She will. I, I can't oh, wait. Oh. <laughs> so I feel like every character has like their spotlight every month. And now like, I feel like Pope Tato just took off, took off. He needs to chill. I need to make <laughs> um, Betty like a spotlight a little bit. And then Jessica, the, the potato that banana was like, oh, I like her. I want to date her. And then vampire potato was kind of jealous. But anyway, that's <laughs> the whole drama with them. <laughs> yeah. It's been real fun, honestly. Like I can just like. That is. There's a lot of voices. I love voice acting, honestly. I've been wanting to like take that opportunity if it ever comes to, you know, being a, a thing on the table. Like I'd love to do some voice acting because I have a lot of voices. I don't know. It's fun. I know the feeling. I mean, I've been like, I'm not, I don't consider myself a proper voice actor. I do voiceover stuff, freelance stuff, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I love doing voices as well. I think it's, it mostly comes from my dad who loved doing voices to make his kids laugh. And I think yeah. I took that on, especially uh, as I got older with, with Gollum and Schmeagle. Yeah. Uh, like <laughs> any, anytime, like anytime I want to make myself or someone else laugh, I just go, the precious, holy shit, it's the precious. <laughs> and like shit like that. It's <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. Thank yeah, you. I would talk to my dogs, like high pitched, like, hi. So oh, but I everyone, just... who doesn't do that? Let's be real here. Yeah, oh, everybody does. How? <laughs> Oh, you're pretty good at that too. <laughs> I don't, I still don't know how, like, I, like you hear my voice now. It's like around the baritone. I don't know how I go up that high. Does anybody know how that works? Voices are I, funny. Yeah. I don't know. It's just like a little unlock that you get, Like it just happens. <laughs> just like, <laughs> yeah. It's an, and I'm working it's, it's on an unlockable. It's one of those like, uh, what, 
God, what are they called again? Uh, it, it, like it's been like a recent thing in video games uh, that people it's, don't like. Mm, um, shortcut? No. No, it's unlockables. Oh. Like you know no, what I'm talking no. about. I don't know what they're called. I don't called. think so. Someone, someone will tell me at some point. I'm sure. In okay. like the in like the most uh, condescending way possible. I appreciate that always, people. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's eleven characters. Amazing! Wow, eleven yeah. characters that you just that you just bringing on. How many of them came in recently? Were they after Toad or before Toad? Um, hmm, let's see. Well, Banana was kind of like there a little bit, but before Toad, and then I just like. Beca it just became like a, uh, the whole character of Banana is that they are an, an entrepreneur that wants to start a business yes. every single day and they have the money and they're a millionaire and they're going to like make it. And then everybody thinks it's a scam because everything that he presents is just very scammy. Everything yes. like his bakery, his croissants are a hundred dollars. And then like he says, like, <laughs> if you buy my lotion, you get your grandma to buy the lotion and then they get two more people. And then those two people get three people <laughs> and we're like pyramid scheme. And he's like, totally legit. I don't know what I anybody is afraid of. <laughs> yeah. So it just became like banana, the scammer. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, he's kind of very like cocky in a way. Like he, he will yell at people and call them like things like stop being lazy and get the fuck to work, stuff like that. And <laughs> like, just, you want to be a millionaire or do you want to like, you know, be a dumbass or no, but like if people get, I don't want people to get offended ever. It's just like right, how yeah, the yeah. banana character is. Well, it's, oh, I, I, so I you think call it's pretty obvious. Like, if I don't have a job, like things right. like that. Right, I, like I think you, everybody going into your stream is fully aware that is a joke because who, because who the hell I hope so. like I, but Banana is a, a, an adoration and inspiration to every entrepreneur out there. But I think it's pretty obvious with the voice. People know it's probably like a joke because who the yeah because who looks at a floating banana <laughs> and thinks takes it seriously exactly exactly mm -hmm. like this is a serious uh, like full on like you can join the business kind of commercial. Um, yeah. So now I want to take us back in time for a moment and talk about some of the things that we actually talked about in the first ever interview we did. This was April 2020. I'm pretty sure we actually recorded it on April Fool's Day as well, to which is a missed opportunity to play a prank, but I digress. Oh, and God. we talked about quite a few things. One of the big thing, of course, was the audience of Twitch. Some coming on to request songs, quote, just to see if you can play it. Now that now that people are starting to figure out who you are, they're seeing you on TikTok and all these things. Are you still getting those kinds of people? And if so, is it as bad as it used to be? Well, yeah, there's always like people that want to request like fast thing, fast songs. And they're not being like they're not being dicks. Like they're just being like, hey, dude, I love this song. And they want to put it in there. I like they I actually get a couple people like in the comments in the in the chat, like I got a challenge for you. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to give it my time. Honestly, if you really want your song to be played, there's just the way to do it. It's right there because there's so many things that I'm focused on that if you really want me to spend time on your song, then go ahead and donate $10. It's, it shouldn't be, you know, yeah. if it's a big deal, right? Like, but they're not insistent or any, well, maybe a couple people have been and they just like get timed out and then hopefully they learn that not to be insistent because right. I cannot focus on one person of the chat. Like I'm, I'm dealing with like five priority songs that people paid for yeah. and I cannot, you know, focus on you. But if you really want it, then just follow the rules. It's all, you know, like I have the rules for a reason because if it, without it, it would be a zoo. <laughs> yeah. It and would I would be. be all over the place. Absolutely. So, I, ADHD, I, HDMI. Yeah. And if, <laughs> and if anybody like if anybody does like want to put their songs in, yeah, donate and just do what I do. Say, oh, it's super easy and just submit fucking black metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And twenty hundred blast really, beats in an, in a row is like it's super I've been easy. Really into it. I've been into it. I've been wanting to get better at blast beats and like faster stuff. So go for it. Challenge me. I'll try it, you know? <laughs> Let's do it. If if it's like been three hours or two hours and a half. I might be too tired to try it. So I tell people, if you want to get a fast song, try to get it at the beginning of the stream. And I'm, mm -hmm. I always start at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Right. Three days a week. Because mm -hmm. if you come in at like 5.30, the, the queue might close by then. And second of all, I'm tired. So I, I don't think it'll happen. But right. maybe. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Uh, but one thing that has changed since 2020 is... The fact is, I remember back then you said at the time I asked you if you were also making original music at the time you weren't. Mm -hmm. But since then, mm -hmm. you did not only take music theory lessons from Thomas Frank, 
but you also mm -hmm. uh, started doing your own little loops as well. Are you still doing yeah. that now? I haven't seen much of that recently. I want to get back to it. I have been just so much has been happening with the stream. I think that uh, I should I should take some time to go back to it this year for sure. I've talked about it because um, I have a couple ideas I want to do. But like I said, it's just been like loops and like mm -hmm. using Ableton and like my little keyboard. And I have a couple songs on YouTube. So like those songs were made on Ableton with my little keyboard. So you can just look up Sunfire TV, Lo-Fi, and you'll see my original music pop up. It has my face on it. So. Three songs only. Three songs. All right, cool. Yeah, because I think uh, like even like for like first timer songs, like again, those are the first ones that you've ever written in your entire life, or the first ones that you've written in your adult life. My entire life, I never write wow. songs. I had, I never wrote anything down, like lyrics. Not even as a kid, like that, just like just writing something. down random, like I can play piano, like that. Nothing like that. <laughs> no, I never <laughs> wrote anything. <laughs> yeah, I I should try that eventually. What, the physically doing that? Too, like the kind of thing? On the <laughs> <laughs> I should do like a parody. No, but I do that all the time on the drums. Like sometimes I go, hey guys, I wrote a song for you guys. Check it out. And so I drum and I go, like I do the painkiller intro and then I do like Enter Sandman and then I do a mashup of like a lot of different weird sounds and then it's weird and I don't mm -hmm. know, it's just random. So that's just like random ass brain. But I've never really sat down to write anything serious unless it's those two, three songs that I told mm -hmm. you about. I think you do have like a, a natural inclination for it because th those first few songs, like they were your first ones ever. And I don't think they were that bad, actually. They were actually like mm. for a beginner. They're actually really good for Thank like I think a it's beginner. just like the looping of it, uh, the ability for you to be able to loop. It's easy. Mm -hmm. Like you just like loop a couple things and then add a couple things. And I don't know. To me, I felt like Ableton like made that easier on me um, right. compared to something that I... Because I'm not very good at like using music tools or like music programs. I'm still learning. I mm -hmm. people think that I'm like all about the, you know, the the easy drummer or good, get good drums. Like all the these uh, programs, I'm not very techy. So I just have to get better at it. And I think Thomas has helped me a lot with like the tech stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Now, but one thing that definitely hasn't changed since that first interview, though, is that you're still doing 80% or sorry, 99.9% .9 of the drumming on Twitch. Uh, but you also do other things on Twitch, too. You have a you have a gaming stream, you have a, a gaming stream coming up, a sponsored gaming stream. You do mm -hmm. dancing streams every once in a while. And earlier mm -hmm. today, actually, at the time of recording this, you were doing Spanish lessons. Uh, what makes you want to diversify so much on Twitch where... Others uh, outside who are teaching people to come on Twitch would recommend to streamers to narrow the field down to a specific mm -hmm. niche. Your niche, right. Um, I think it's just because of my personality. I get uh, a little bit burnt out. Burnt out. Burnt, mm -hmm. burn, burnt out. Burnt and out. So <laughs> you get burnt out. I just want to change it up. That's all. And then like... I don't know. I, I think people, it's like a win-win in a way. Like we kind of mm -hmm. uh, support each other with like new content and then, you know, it's a sub goal. So like there is a lot more, I mean, I also don't do like costumes for sub goals. I do a lot of costumes for sub goals, but like, and the sub goals, like I said, it, it helps towards like saving up, you know, to, to get out of here and all of that mm -hmm. to move and everything. But a lot of the costumes that I've done were just, I'm going to do something spontaneous and I just want to change it up a little bit. And honestly, it's been really cool to see a lot of people stick around no matter what I'm streaming. So that's like something I wanted to test too, to see all these new people coming in to watch me drum and see Toad. Are they going to watch me for anything that I do? And so I've been doing those like different category, like the category of dancing, cooking, gaming, the scary game happened, also the Spanish. I've been mm -hmm. uh, very happy. It's really cool to see a lot of people watch no matter what I do. And then obviously the most people want to see me drum. So the viewership is higher when I drum. But like I've been having a lot of people that just come back for the stream no matter what I do. And that means a lot. That's awesome. It makes me want to cry because it's so freaking like, holy crap. I can't believe you guys. Because before I used to do drum streams. Most people would be there. And then I would change category to gaming uh, mm -hmm. because I wanted to, you know, because I wanted to change it. I want to have variety. And then I would have like maybe like one third of the viewers they wouldn't come back to because they probably don't are not interested in that. You know, so like. It's, it makes me happy to see like a lot of people are coming back just to see my personality in general. So okay, and yeah, fun. and I think that's a uh, that's a great thing to uh, to aspire to, especially on Twitch. 
Um, so yeah. uh, one thing I do want to get into real quick, uh, if you're okay to do so, we don't have to, if you don't want to, are you okay if we talk about, uh, the, the green card immigration stuff that happened not too long ago? Yeah. I mean, I've just been in the waiting process right now. It's super slow. Um, there are a couple, there are a couple, um, speed bumps that put me behind to getting the green card and yeah. then the pandemic happened. And then now we're just waiting, uh, to, to see what's going to be the next step because we have to fix one speed bump that happened uh, with a judge, and then you know we got to go to court. Yeah, that and was, then, I remember hearing about that. That was a fuster clock back then uh, when that yeah. like a GoFundMe had to be set up and everything. And the you GoFundMe and, which, was for the lawyer because the lawyer, yeah. It. But you met that goal within a day, uh, yeah. and you did like a thank you stream like immediately uh -huh. afterwards. Yeah, because um, I think it's because Matt Heafy from Trivium saw it and reshared it, and a lot of his fans donated because right. he was like, "Help my friend," and then Alex bent. Dude, they're such cool dudes. I love them. Like, I couldn't believe that they were helping towards that too because, I don't know, I guess it's cool that Twitch has brought, you know, brought these these people, like, in my life, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're friends, and, you know, they're I can call them friends, and, like, we just met on Twitch and social media and they just ended up helping out with such a personal thing. And to me, that's, like, a lot of celebrities, to me, they're celebrities. A lot of celebrities mm -hmm. are, don't do that. They don't really talk or care about fans as much as I've seen Matt, you know, show the way that he cares about his fans. I don't know. He always like reposts somebody's GoFundMe or something. Well, that's the thing I love about, uh, cause I think that's, it's, I, I know it's definitely not restricted to the metal community, but that's the thing I love about metal and the community involved is that we are a community of people. And mm -hmm. given that you, by this point, by that point, when all this shit was going on and it was obviously, mm -hmm. I'm guessing probably very trying times at the time, it mm -hmm. was like, the fact that uh, Matt, you've played the games with Matt before, you've been in the stream, he knows who you are. Uh, at, 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 at that point, I think it's very clear to show like the strength of the metal community as a whole mm -hmm. uh, really shown through at that point. Because as soon as like you were posting this, uh, as soon as uh, Kelborn actually, I believe he posted the GoFundMe link. Um, as soon as this was like becoming like a thing, like it was out in the open, people knew about it. All of a sudden, like donate, like people in your community were sharing it. I know I shared it out, uh, and then Matt shared it out. It just blew up from there. Yeah, like this, so the, the strength of community, crazy. I think, is really strong in metal, and I think that really is a testament to the whole thing. That's true. Yeah, I feel like the whole like you know metal community that has met me on Twitch, like they've been really supporting, like Matt and then Dan and Jay from Tesseract. Matt Garska too. He was awesome. Like everybody's just so supportive. So I'm happy mm -hmm. that, you know, Twitch has brought me these friends that I've never thought I would talk to. Yeah. You know? But yeah, as, as we said, the, the, the GoFundMe was for the lawyer. Can you tell me what was going on at the point? Cause something was screwy was going on with the process because of something yeah. that happened. Yeah. So it's basically like, I can talk about it more when it's, uh, solved, but basically mm -hmm. the details wise, but like for now I can mm -hmm. just say there's some speed bumps with my immigration uh, application that, um, it ended up being, there's a lot of errors that happened. So it, it slowed down the process and then we have to wait longer and show some more evidence with a judge. And then, yeah, hopefully that'll be the last step, but we're just waiting now to get everything like moving forward because the lawyer it definitely is a help like we wouldn't be able to do this alone so having the lawyer helped a lot and um you know she made everything more smooth there's like this big ass packet of papers that were sent out last week and so hopefully you know that that's, that's going to be looked at um in new york city and then we have to get it you know um transferred to buffalo because i'm here now before i used to live in new york city so a lot of stuff and like you know just speed bumps and i'll talk to more talk more about it detail wise on my streams once everything right. is solved but yeah okay that's fair yeah. uh and with <laughs> with that foster clock out of the way so let's get, get into like the future of sunfire tv the channel the person behind the channel and the many colorful characters we see what does the future look like as of right now i mean i just feel like i've been enjoying this whole like self like this I'm I'm my own artist I don't have a band obviously a lot of people ask me hey when are you going to join a band I want to <laughs> see you on on stage one day I would totally buy tickets to see you like I've just been enjoying this whole me thing and the fact that I don't have a band there's a, a lot of reasons towards that because 
you know, because I don't have a green card, I don't have a license. I can't drive to like studios and like, I don't have an acoustic kit that I want to like carry here and there. So like, it becomes like this uh, obstacle that I have right now that, uh, you know, I don't want to deal with that right now. Maybe in the future when I have more uh, ability to move around and have my own car and everything, then that would help, uh, you know, that dream of having a band and then finding the right people too. I just haven't really, a lot of the people that I know that are, I would like to have a band with are not here in my area, you know, like, and I haven't really thought about talking to people and making a band or creating something. I, I, it's all like virtual. And a lot of the things, the things that TikTok provides with the tools of duetting has been like well, something that I just use for now to kind of just, you know, bring people to the spotlight with my posts and then they post it. And then it's just online thing has just been so comfortable and easy. And then I, I have my own schedule. So mm-hmm. for the future, I would say, yeah, maybe there could be a band in the future. Uh, I would perform on stage for either people that want me to fill in for a couple shows and stuff like that, like a session drummer, or, you know, it would be cool to do uh, an episode on Drumio if they ever invite me. But I think that I'm not there yet, but maybe, I don't know, who knows? Like they invite a lot of drummers. So I sometimes I think like, am I big enough to be on that? Like, I don't know. And then the America's Got Talent hasn't gotten back to me. They they didn't get back to me after me, like after applying because they asked me to apply anyway after mm-hmm. the toad happened. And so I was like, okay, I applied. I did the uh, audition with America's Got Talent through Zoom. I hope the audio was good because, oh my God, I don't know. There's a lot of different contestants and they said America's Got Talent episode, I think season 18, you would probably, you know, if you get accepted, you would be on it. So stuff like that. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I just feel like I just want people to get to know me more and social media has been helping with that. So I just want to like keep pushing social media and then people finding me on the internet and working with me. And then let's see who else comes into the picture. You know, like it would be cool to work with Fila or Nike or, you know, like those brands. Like if I could just, you know, get to a point where I said that, yo, I work with this brand and I'm super thankful, like, it's a huge brand, you know, like I love sportswear. I'm always wearing leggings and, and, you know, sports t-shirts and, and, and tennis shoes. And I think it would be awesome if, you know, that sometime in the future working with Adidas or Nike, that's something that I would love to do in the future. But who knows? That's just something that I think of. Um, mm-hmm. And then performing live and everything like that would be cool. So I think those are just the things that I think of. But for now, I think I've been saying the word think a lot. <laughs> think, think is uh, like the main word in everyone's vocabulary today. It's okay. I think. I, I think. think. It's, just, it's just like, you know, there's a lot of obstacles right now. But for now, mm-hmm. this has been fun. And people are happy to watch me. Mm-hmm. I'm happy to make people happy. So right. if we're both happy and there's a feedback loop of happiness and joy and chaos... I mean, I'm in for that for a while. So we'll see. Now, that technically was my final question, but I almost forgot to uh, talk about one avenue of Sunfire TV uh, uh, or or, or Sunfire in general that has uh, been going on. And that was the uh, the modeling side gig that you had uh, or still have. Are you still doing that? Yes. And I basically got inspired by my mother that was a model in her 20s. And Mm -hmm. I told her about it and she was like, really cool. That's awesome. Um. You know, so I, that's something that's been helping a lot with my patron too. A lot of people are supporting that. So I'm happy about that. I'm glad that, um, you know, I can kind of, uh, represent my, my mom's, uh, youth with that. And it brings me confidence too. you know, something else to do that I like, cause mm-hmm. I just always thought that that would be fun to do. Like yeah. if they ever hired me for like a magazine cover, who knows? Maybe one day, I don't know. <laughs> and it's something you're doing on uh, on Patreon. You you did do it on OnlyFans for a bit, but uh, you've moved on yeah. to just doing oh it on Patreon. Oh my God, OnlyFans sucks, dude. Yeah. I hate it. Oh, actually, sorry. To preface this sorry. for anybody listening, just because OnlyFans, it's not nudes. It's bathing oh, suit wasn't, modeling. No, 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 no. I don't do that. No hey, nudes. Really, I want to make sure because people yeah. hear OnlyFans and they and they immediately start going, <laughs> OnlyFans? OnlyFans? Well, she has OnlyFans? <laughs> <laughs> it was never like that ever. No, no, only, no. Of course not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Freaking, don't get in my DMs now. It's only bathing yeah, yeah, yeah. suit. And I'm not showing anything that it requires. Uh, A center bar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's it's super benign. It's something that you see in magazines, whatever. Yeah. Like you don't it's it's not prom. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh so so you, so you're still doing it. Do you know like I uh, do you see yourself still doing this like for like the foreseeable future or is it something that you're just like uh 
something you kind of just want to do for a little bit as like uh, this one little thing that you decide to do for the time being. Like I said, if they ever find my modeling as whoever magazine, like I'm down, like it would be cool mm-hmm. to do it for real. But for now, it's just like a side gig that I kind of enjoy, you know, it's fun. And I got a better camera too, so it looks better. And mm-hmm. I'm starting to use Lightroom and it looks cool with all the, you know, the editing and everything like uh, with like, cause I have this like retro filter I added, you know, like, it's yeah. like okay, listen, it's better to <laughs> add a filter than just put the freaking pure thing there. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't do a lot of Photoshop. Okay. I just, right. I just delete like a little bit of like, like spots around my, you know, I never do the thing where they go like this with their hips. Oh, they, 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 they put, they add in the hourglass. Yeah. No, no, dude. No. Why would I do that then? Just be yourself and be pure, mm-hmm. you know? So. There you go. That's a that's a good lesson from uh, from Sunfire TV right here on the Metal Robot Love Podcast. Love yourself, be pure, trust yourself. Exactly. Trust your body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I I usually I'll ask I'll ask uh, my podcast guests or uh, uh, interview guests the uh, cereal box question, but you've already answered that question back in 2020. So cereal I box. think yeah, I, the cereal box. Like the if you could be any cereal box character, you answered that question. The toucan. Was Coco, it the toucan? He, I believe you said Coco Crispies was uh, your response really? back in 2020. So that's the elephant. Okay. So that's like a uh, Latin has it, has it changed since then? I just like Coco Pebbles. I don't want to be Pedro freaking Flintstones. But <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I want to be Forget cereal. The I'm the Flintstones vitamins that kids used to eat. <laughs> I want to, I would, I would be the toucan, but I don't eat Fruit Loops much. I just think the toucan is cool. Sam. That's a, that is a good response. I've had plenty of responses that have been like really out there. Like uh the like, like this woman, uh Ore uh from Akiavel, a melodic death metal band from France. Her response was, Can I be the milk? <laughs> what? <laughs> that oh was a response. I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Rules are who rules are for pussies. <laughs> Yes. All right, we'll can see. I be the little game behind the box so you can solve? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No hesitation, no rules. Let's go. <laughs> There All right, go. son, thank you so much for coming on the Metal Robot Podcast. I appreciate your time so much. Thank you for inviting me again. It was fun. Thank you. Sunfire TV on the Metal Robot Podcast, though, conveniently, her characters weren't there. Lucky for them, too, because Banana still owes me the $1,000 fee I paid for their free service. I want my money, Banana. All Sunfire links can be found in the description of this podcast. Check out her streams and hopefully you'll have as good a time as we do whenever she streams. All right, let's wrap things up and tell you what's coming next week. You just listened to MRP, the Metal Robot Podcast. And that's my cue. We got to wrap up. So let me tell you what's coming up next week. We're looking at quite a bit of fun stuff. First off, Demiricus's Scott Wilson will be joining me once again to continue our talk about Demiricus and the new album Chaotic Lethal. But also, I want to hear from you. What are the best power metal bands in existence? Old, new, active, not active? I don't care. I want to hear from you on this. Send me a note with the hashtag Metal Robot Podcast and your answer will be featured on the show next week. In the meantime, thanks for listening to the Metal Robot Podcast. You can follow the show on the internet, YouTube, Metal Robot Reviews, Facebook and Twitter at The Metal Robot, Instagram at The Dot Metal Robot. You can also check out everything Metal Robot on TheMetalRobot.com for videos, podcasts, press, and so much more. I'm Tom McKay. If you enjoyed this episode and you want more, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts. I'll see you in the mosh pit next time. Have a good night. 